the assistant director of graduate career services um, at the Mark School. Um, I'm with my colleague Suzanne, who is the deputy director um, for for uh, career services and deputy um, of alumni relations as well. So we are going to do uh, an event with two parts today. The third, the first part, first 30 minutes, we're gonna do a moderated discussion with our Marks alumni panelists. And then we're going to go into breakout rooms. Um, and really it's gonna be quite easy for everybody. I will say this is our first time doing this, so please bear with us. Um, but it'll go fairly smoothly, we feel confident about. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our speakers. So in the breakout rooms, you'll be able to talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. For now, everyone's on mute. When you're in the breakout rooms, everyone will be unmuted and you'll be able to, uh, talk, to talk to the alums directly. We're gonna try for three rounds of 10 minutes each after this, after this piece. Okay, so, um, to introduce everybody and maybe alumni, if you can just raise your hand, your, your virtual or physical hand, um, when I say your name, that would be great. So we, have, we are honored to have Deborah Mack, who graduated in 2005. She is an MPA alum, she was enough. She is a senior policy analyst at the Office of Cybersecurity with the US House of Representatives and Excelicon. We have Tracy Rowe with us, who got her MPA in 2015. She's a senior policy analyst at the NYC Office of Management and Budget. We have Angelica Martinez, who graduated in 2014 with her MPA. She is a policy analyst um, doing policy and research at New York State Senate Democratic Conference. We have Stephen Campbell, who graduated in 2018 with his MPA who is a data and policy analyst at PHI. And we've got Mark Stobel, who graduated in 2016, who is a senior policy analyst at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. So thank you so much, um, all of you, for being with us. And we're so glad to have you as part of the Marks community. Um, so let's dive into questions, because everybody is very curious to hear from you. So if let's start with Deborah. Um, so Deborah, and we're going to go down the line with the same question because everybody has kind of different roles. So Deborah, knowing that a policy analyst role can vary by employer, what does this role look like where you work and how does it fit in with the larger agency or organization? Hi, thanks so much for having me. I, it's a complex question because as Marnie stated, I work for the U.S. House of Representatives here in the D.C. area, and the House is different from federal agencies, just like the Senate is different from federal agencies. So a role like this is going to be is specific to the office that I work in, by way of to sum up. So I would say right now, um, I've been in the job two years. I had provide policy guidance and development on the business operations side of the house, which is not the legislative side where I've also worked. So it's probably similar to being, I would guess, in an agency where I work with technical experts and the business sale development people who buy and manage the products that we use, but everything has to be tailored to our audience. So for to sum up, it's hard for me to answer specifically, except to say that it takes really good critical analysis, thinking skills, time management skills, research skills which you all have based on your backgrounds and just an ability to work with different people and figure out what the client needs so i'm not sure if that quite answers your question but and also i'll say this because of the pandemic and the fact that the house has had to convert to working remotely just like the senate has we've had to move really quickly probably more quickly than an agency ever would at the government at the federal, state, or local level, because we've had to figure out how to give the members and staff tools they can use to hold hearings remotely, which you may or may not have been tuning into. So I would say we move faster than probably most of the federal government. Okay, amazing, Tracy. And can you actually just add one more little piece, which is, can you tell us, I know every day is gonna be different for you, um, 
but a little bit of what, what you might, might expect like on a typical day. Is that directed at me? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, oh sorry, you said Tracy, I wasn't sure. Um, oh, sorry. Um, it's hard, that's a hard question to answer just because we are working remotely. But I would say typically in terms of doing work, it means for me coming up with ideas, like I'm working on a proposal for an idea that I brought up in uh, my weekly staff meeting last week. So it means it's figuring out how to get the information, the background research or information I need to put forward a policy that will have to be go through several level, levels of vetting before it's approved. And again, everything is tailored to the needs of the members and staff. So there's a big deal about security because we are continually hacked. And also for me in terms of research, while I can read blog posts or other like even governmental publications, I, had, I can have to only really rely on certain sources that are kind of trusted in the environment where I work. So that means I, you won't see me really citing magazines or journal publications unless it's something that's kind of officially approved. Gotcha. Thank you so much for that, Deborah. Okay. Um, so yes, let us move on to Tracy. So Tracy, it's the same question. If you can tell us um, a little bit about your role, a little bit about where it fits into the organization and what you do on a day to day basis. Yeah, so I work for the New York City Office of Management and Budget in the Community Development Unit. So there we receive an annual entitlement grant from the Department of Housing and Urban Development called the Community Block Development Grant. And it's an annual grant that's allocated to low-income cities and um, counties um, on a formula basis. So New York City receives the highest allocation um, in the United States. And it's always um, questioned by the president regarding its usefulness, but um, I really think that we do a lot of great things um, for the low and moderate income community in New York City. Um, we do a lot of work for the homeless, um, the elderly population, um, the list goes on. We do a lot of um, tasks. So what I do is essentially make sure that city agencies that receive um, community block development grant funds are complying with federal regulations. So there I essentially talk to a lot of my contacts that are in city agencies that are overlooking the programs to make sure that what they're doing is compliant with federal regulations, whether it be section three, which makes sure that, which makes sure that um, if we fund um, construction related tasks, at least 30% of the new hires have to be low and moderate income persons and not a lot of city agencies like to collect this information, especially since um, you're not supposed to, um, well now it's not required that you ask for household um, income information, but we're trying to work with the law department to get around that, especially since this information is required. So. Um, that's essentially things that I do on a, a daily basis is make sure that we are collecting um, information that shows that the program is moving along, it's achieving its um, yearly accomplishments, and we're reporting to the public as well as um, the things that we're doing with CDBG entitlement grant funds. And now with the coronavirus, we received uh, an additional allocation of um, $102 million to make sure that we're allocating that to city agencies for coronavirus relief or infectious disease relief. So now we're just trying to figure out programs that will fit the bill for that related tasks. Okay. And I know that was long-winded, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay, we appreciate the information. Um, so let's go to Angelica, same question. I'm on mute now. <laughs> um, so I, um, in terms of, I'll, I'll start with, with my day-to-day -day first. Um, so I'm working at the Senate uh, for the Democratic Conference in specific, um, and we have a whole policy unit, and I'm one of six. Um, and Basically what we do is we do background research on all of the policy proposals that our members have. 
um, and we prepare them for debate um, on the floor. Um, so that means that we have to put documents together uh, defending the policies and uh, back them up with stats or information. And like Deborah, we are very careful on um, who we cite. And we, uh, particularly because the, the stuff that we put on, on our documents is repeated by the senators on the floor. So if they say something that's inaccurate, uh, that's like really bad. <laughs> so um, we have to be very extremely careful on um, the type of information that we gather. Um, so, but on a daily basis, you're just doing research nonstop. That's pretty much um, the, the gist of it. Thank you, Angelica. Um, let's go to Stephen. Same question. Great, thanks, Marty. Um, like Angelica, I'll start with my day-to-day. -day. Um, I work at a fairly small organization. There are only about 20 of us, and our team is maybe like three or four people. Um, in my role, I track policy and practice trends uh, as they relate to the direct care workforce. So these are paid frontline caregivers in healthcare and long-term care. And uh, they're sort of historically undervalued. Um, for example, they are excluded from minimum wage and overtime protections until just a few years ago. Um, so really there's a lot of progress to be made for this workforce uh, and they're really, really important. So a lot of people are focused on uh, how do we recruit and retain these workers um, and that's particularly sort of like a state Medicaid issue because state Medicaid has a big role in it. So in my role, I'm sort of a generalist. I uh, get to sort of try and stay in touch with what's happening on the ground and disseminate best practices as they arise. I sometimes give technical assistance directly to states. So I'll fly out and give a little presentation and answer questions. Um, the, there's been quite a lot of press about this workforce in recent years, especially in the context of the pandemic. So we've been fielding a lot of press calls and sort of radio interviews, these sorts of things. Um, but in general, it's all sort of related to uh, developing and disseminating uh, strong policies uh, that sort of undo decades and decades of injustices imposed on this workforce, um, not just because they deserve it, but also because it's, it's absolutely necessary to ensure that we have a stable long-term care system. So yeah, so we get to do lots of different things, but it's a great job and I love it. That's great, Stephen, thank you. Um, and Mark, last but not least, same question. Yeah, thanks, Marty, and hi, everyone. Uh, so my main role is managing this national initiative called Stepping Up um, in partnership with two other national organizations, and it helps counties address mental illness in their jail systems. And so a lot of that work is providing broad-based technical assistance to the more than 500 counties that are part of the initiative, uh, leading the development of different products and tools like webinars, briefs, um, self-assessment tools for them to track their data, virtual learning communities and communities of practice and things like that. And then I also provide some direct technical assistance to agencies that get grants from the Department of Justice at the federal level to implement grant programs to reduce the number of mental, reduce the number of people with mental illness in their jails. Um, and so that contributes to my organization's uh, goal of improving policy and program implementation and practices. And we kind of take a broad view for policies where it encompasses state, local policies, and even policies at the agency level. And we're, we're not really about changing the policies um, in terms of doing advocacy or even uh, state education, but really more to the agencies themselves that are implementing these programs and helping them navigate the different policy landscapes in their jurisdictions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mark. Okay, so um, everybody's doing such important work. It's very impressive. Um, okay, so let's go on to the next question, and we'll just go down the line again, um, starting with Deborah. So, Deborah, if you would tell us kind of how you landed your current job and the path you took to get there. Um, and also, I would ask everybody to include you know, if you knew someone at, at your new place of employment, did you just apply online cold? That would be helpful information as well. Thank you. Um, I got my current position 
and I'm, it's complicated. I'm, as like I said, not on the legislative side of the house, I'm on the business operations side and I'm back as a federal contractor because I've been out of the area, out west and came back. So I actually got my current position by staying in touch with a woman who'd been, who was formerly an intern who I worked with closely when I was a legislative staffer several years ago on the House Homeland Security Committee. So when I had to transition back, I just did the typical process of asking people what was happening, what was going on, was working on a friend's campaign here in Maryland where I live, and then just got an email, a text out of the blue from this individual saying there's an opening in the, where I work back at the house. Would you be interested? And I, so I just, I applied. And honestly, I didn't think much of it because I was looking in other directions and trying to do more campaign consulting, but the opportunity came through quickly and I accepted it. So it's it's kind of like, it's, that's just how that happened. But I'd say for me, having been in DC almost 20 years, I've gotten jobs through various sources. So it's, you can apply online. There is a published list of jobs uh, for the house and the Senate has their own. But honestly, most people get their positions either by, you might get something just by applying, but usually it goes through referral because they, there's, they're, so many offices are inundated with applications. So I, I would say there's no one pathway, but it's always best if you are directly referred. That's the shortest answer I can give you. Okay, great. Um, and Tracy, let's go to you. Tell us, how did you get your job up and how to get there? Um, so I did the Washington semester, um, my last semester at Baruch, and there I interned at the U.S. Department of Commerce. Um, is that how you say it correctly? Department of, yeah, the Department of Commerce at the Minority Business Development Agency. And that was a really good experience um, working um, for the federal government, um, just learning the ins and outs of how government works. So I guess that was a, a really good opportunity that I had to display on my resume when I applied to the um, New York City Office of Management and Budget. I just applied on the website, to be honest with you. I applied and I forgot about it because like a month later, that's when they got around to um, looking at resumes and that's when they contacted me. Um, so yeah, that, it, it was pretty simple. Um, I just applied online. I included a cover letter, which is really important because they read those and they make sure that what you're applying to and your cover letter, um, it lines up with um, the mission of the organization or the task force. So it's really good to keep in mind that when you're applying for a job that you write in the position that you're looking for and um, how you're personally connected to it. Awesome. Thank you, Tracy. Um, let's go to Angelica. Um, so I got my job through like a path of connections to several people. And it started with Suzanne, actually. Um, so Suzanne recommended me uh, to apply to this job with the New York City Comptroller's Office. Um, and I got that job. And then once I was in there, uh, one of my coworkers was running a campaign for, for a state senator. Um, they ended up winning the campaign and he was looking to put his team together and he reached out to me and said, hey, you know, would you like to join our team? Um, at the time when I was working for the controller, I was doing like mostly administrative work and I really wanted to get into policy and, you know, more legislative work. So I was hired by uh, the senator um, to be his director of policy and legislation. And at the time, the, the majority of the Senate was um, Republican. So I was working in the minority, which was a completely different scenario than it is now. And um, that moved me to Albany, which is where I live now. Um, and I was doing purely legislative work. The amount of policy I was doing for the senator was very little. Um, and once we won the majority in 2018, um, I was reached out by leadership and they just said, hey, you know, we're, we're growing our, our policy team. We heard that you were interested in policy because I had told that to my senator. And, you know, would you want to join our, our policy team? And, you know, that, that, that's what I did. That's because I was already like on the inside. However, there are two of my team members, uh, as we were growing the policy team since 2018, 
two of my team members just applied through Indeed and went through the interview process and like our bosses liked them and, and they were hired. And they're recent MPA grads too. Like they just finished their MPA program just last year uh, in you know, 2019, 2019, yeah, in 2019. And they joined us like months after graduating. So that's, that, that was also a path, but like that's the path that I took. Awesome, thank you. Steven. Um, so I feel like I, I don't wanna duplicate what uh, Angelica and, and Tracy and Deborah have already said, but it's some combination between relationships and um, having a good resume, right? Uh, I think for me, I, I just applied to my job online. I was moving to New York and I didn't know anyone. It was really stressful to put all of my eggs in one basket with this job and it, it worked out. So I got extremely lucky. But that's not the full story. I think the full, the more complete story, speaking to Tracy's points, that uh, my resume told a good story because I, um, I, I did have some unpaid internships. I also did a semester in DC through my undergraduate to finance those internships. That's often a challenge, right? Because it's sort of this like filtering of people of means versus not. Um, so, I mean, in general, I just think unpaid internships are <laughs> kind of stupid. <laughs> they should just be paid. But, um, you know, if you're facing challenges and in finding internships and developing the experience that you need, there are other options available to you. Um, interning part-time and working part-time uh, should be possible. And, you know, if your organizations are expecting you to prioritize your free labor over uh, your means to support yourself, then they're probably not worth, worth your time. Um, but... Uh, and then volunteer opportunities too. I mean, volunteering to just sort of do the things that you want to do um, in your free time is a great opportunity to start building out the resume that tells the story that you want it to tell. Thank you, Stephen. Awesome. Um, let's go to Mark. Yeah, and then I echo what everyone else has said already. And then for um, for my story, I've been with my organization a little more than five years. And for the first role I had there, I applied the old fashioned way by submitting a cold application through Idealist. Um, but my uh, MPA was definitely very instrumental in helping me get promoted from program associate to a policy analyst and then from policy analyst to senior policy analyst. Awesome. Okay, excellent. Um, so for our final question, um, and by the way, for this final question, everybody, feel free to keep it brief, um, just to be sort of time. Um, so I think a lot of people are interested in knowing, you know, if you are hiring a policy analyst who is going to work under you or for your team, what are the experiences and skills you're looking for? Let's start with Deborah. I would say get really good critical thinking skills are key because um, there's something I, the idea that I'm working on now, sometimes you have to use a scattershot approach to finding the information that's necessary. Good, not good, really strong research skills, strong writing skills, and I would say creative, creativity in the sense that even though policy in and of itself is dry, with some projects, especially if there's not very much direction given or any of for me like for example with the what I'm working on now it's really self generated that it you have to be able to kind of think along different angles I hate to use the, the term think out of the box but you have to kind of approach policy issues from a different way depending on the organization that you are working for so you just have to think differently I think that's the old Apple slogan awesome thank you Deborah. thank you Tracy what about you skills and experience you're looking for? Um, I actually would agree with Deborah. I think that research and writing skills are really important, um, especially when you're dealing with like the federal government and federal regulations. You have to read a lot of boring um, proposals that they may have when it comes to um, CDBG with me. Um, so you have to really just get down and, and read some really sometimes boring and uninteresting stuff and really comprehend and make use out of it. So I think that's a really important skill to have. Okay, awesome. I have a feeling a lot of the, uh, our other panelists are going to say similar things. Feel free, if you, if you do agree with, with Deborah and Tracy, to um, tweak the question a little bit and say, 
if you're looking at a resume, what is the experience you want to see on there? Um, so let's go to Angelica. So I agree with the things that were said in terms of research and writing. Um, like one of the things that's specific to our team is um, political experience, uh, whether this is running political campaigns or uh, working for a politician, um, because uh, the documents that we create are, are internal to our members and are catered and a lot of the decisions that happen legislatively are political. So that's important to, to, to have. So like, that's definitely one of the things. So an advanced degree is definitely required for my team, preferably in policy analysis. Uh, in fact, all of our team members have MPAs, except for our boss, who's a lawyer um, and has worked in politics for his entire life. Um, so, um, yeah, but, but political experience, research, strong research, strong writing, and uh, organizational skills are also a must because we have to like do things on the fly immediately. Like there's a senator on the floor and you need to write something for him in 20 minutes and he's going to read it. So you need to make sure you're organized and you can get the thing done as fast as possible. Okay, awesome. Steven. Um, I'll keep this really brief. I mean, I think uh, one thing that always pops out, and I work with some really meticulous people, um, if there are typos in your resume, if there are errors in your resume, those really jump out. Um, so uh, best practice, have lots of people read your resumes uh, before you submit them um, and get their input. Make sure that uh, the points you're making are being communicated clearly. Um, uh, keep it brief too and sort of like plenty of white space if you're like have like quarter inch margins we're going to notice and things like that um but uh in terms of experience you know i think that it doesn't necessarily come through in job titles it also comes through in like how you frame the message your existing experience and how how are you able to sort of leverage that into uh, a policy analysis position it's always possible awesome thank you let's go to mark yeah, and at my organization in particular, we often look for people who have experience doing direct practice, whether that's um, in a clinical field like social work, psychology, or um, on the criminal justice side, like whether that's um, experience as a corrections officer or probation officer or court coordinator um, or some combination of any of those. I, I think that we look for people who have that sort of direct practice to, um, to take that practice and build that into um, the policy work that we do. Okay, excellent. Um, so thank you everybody, we're right on time. Um, Suzanne, how are we doing for breakout rooms? Suzanne has been diligently working on the breakout rooms throughout this whole time. Thank, thank you, Suzanne. I was having a little panic because I couldn't figure something out, but anyway, now we're all good. So the rooms are set up. There's somewhere between eight and 10 people in a room. And so you will get an invitation inviting you to join a breakout room, which you'll need to accept. And then um, I think Marty mentioned this in the beginning, but I can't remember. Uh, the panelists are going to be the ones who change rooms after 10 minutes. So um, students or students and alumni will stay in the same group. Um, and then you will, there'll be a little bit of a lag. We'll, and then we'll move the panelists. Um, and so feel free to use the chat function or to, well, you're gonna unmute everyone, Marnie, right? So they can, so then um, you can mute or unmute yourself when you're in these breakout rooms. And we'll, we'll give you a notification when you have about a minute left in your room. And then at the very end, for those who can stick around, we'll bring everybody back together um, just to say a final thank you and goodbye. So hope you can stick around, but we understand some of you may have to have to run out. So without further ado, I'm gonna open all the rooms. Here we go. Okay. And everyone can now has the power to unmute themselves, just FYI.
If for some reason anyone's having trouble getting to their room, let us know. It seems like just, I don't know why Angelica, is she still here? I'll, I'll message her. Oh no, she's gone oh, now. Okay. And Nar, Nar Hion? Maybe it's somebody who's not actually. Maybe they need to step away. Oh, do you want to stop recording? Oh, yeah. Good idea.